we have um, someone substituting in for one of our members. That's what we're waiting on. But I think we'll get started with without him. Um, and we're going to start. Oh, welcome back, I should say. Welcome back to the, the PEG Access um, TV uh, work group. We had our public hearing this morning. We're coming back to um, try to figure out where we go from here. And we're going to start off uh, with Dan Glanville, who will be talking about um, funding as it is, uh, revenues as, as they exist now. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Um, so a, a, a few items. Uh, the issues that I'm going to speak to are the uh, settlement pertaining to the CPG uh, between uh, Comcast and the regulatory body uh, here in Vermont. As you know, we went through a renewal of our CPG. There were some contested issues. Uh, groups were authorized to partake in mediation, which is a standard process in the process that we were in. I know that uh, Clay attended those mediation sessions, as well as Lauren Glenn, uh, and me and others. And uh, we had about five of them, I think. Uh, Great. Three. Although it seemed like there were five. <laughs> 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 they, were, they, were long they were long days. They were yeah. starting early in the morning that went uh, sometimes into the uh, near dark in, on the, in the late uh, month of June, so uh, <laughs> long days. But we resolved some pretty substantive issues, and one was the interactive program guide, whereby we're going to move the pay channels from their current location uh, into the four-digit universe. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the pay providers, the AMOs in uh, Vermont, and I'll use that word interchangeably, but they mean the same thing, uh, will be uh, have access to the interactive program guide on Comcast systems, so we're happy to be able to work that out. Uh, and one other thing we're also working on is that uh, there will be $77,000 in payments that will be made uh, to the AMOs for rebranding expenses associated with the change in the channel positions. Uh, I recently uh, went through the process of approving those checks, so those will be uh, hopefully cut and sent very soon. Uh, $3,500 per AMO for that cost. Uh, as well as a one-time payment of $55,000 uh, for playback uh, equipment uh, in support of a provision whereby we're going to launch a state HD channel. Uh, we're going to pay that money this year even though uh, we're going to work with the AMO as to when to launch that because it doesn't have to be launched until 2021 but we're going to work to uh, launch that at a time that meets the needs of the AMOs because there's some work that they have to do to get ready for that. Uh, in addition, we've been constructing uh, additional plant miles here in Vermont since the CPG was renewed. Additional what? Plant, uh, plant miles. It's oh, the, okay. Uh, yeah, the miles. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be, uh, we will complete 350 miles uh, before completion of the CPG. And we're well under, uh, well on uh, within the target to complete that, probably ahead of schedule. Uh, we will also maintain existing video return lines that exist, and that's the ability for uh, the AMOs or pay providers to go live from uh, various locations that exist today. Uh, and we put in some language that will also, uh, the parties reached an amicable resolution on how we will build new return lines going forward. Uh, in addition, we have a one-time payment of $100,000 uh, to be used by VAN uh, to look at some alternative technologies uh, whereby they can utilize this for the provision of uh, remote origination. And then we will have a uh, payments of $440,000, which will be $20,000 per AMO, which will be used by the AMOs for <coughs> internet service at the PEG studios in remote locations, uh, and also to support the use of alternative technologies. Uh, as a result of that courtesy service uh, uh, that is currently offered to the AMOs uh, will not continue after a date certain. Uh, but those are the funding requirements uh, of, the, of the settlement, uh, and all of those uh, are, uh, we're, are settled in, in place, and the uh, checks are being cut for that process. Do you have anything to add to that, Lauren? No, I quite told you. Questions? Uh, Dan, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so, 
We heard uh, some testimony in the hearing this morning that uh, the actual amounts of payments from Comcast and our cable companies have actually decreased over the, over the past year. And is that something that, um, that you could concur with or, or uh, review or whatever? Well, let, let me offer this. And I, I think there was some great testimony here today, and we've always uh, had a good working relationship with the AMOs and understanding the benefit that uh, PEG access and AMO access brings to the local community. And we think that was most of the testimony that was re received here today. That being said, it, so for instance, I, we had a spreadsheet that was entered into our meeting at, at some point that did show the funding from 2006 through 2019. And there was a substantial increase from the 2006 calendar year through that, uh, through really 2017. And there was a one-time gap change which resulted in a decrease to uh, the AMO payments for calendar year 2018. That being said, if, if, I believe if you look at the data that's presented, you'll see a pretty uh, substantial hockey stick increase prior to that juncture. And if you remove the gap uh, decrease, I think you'll see that we've reached a pretty level funding uh, where it has not seen a decrease per se. And I think that presented at our last meeting, without gap being included, we think that funding has been fairly static in 16, 17, 18, and we think we're on target to be, to be consistent with that in 19 as well. So the gap funding, mm -hmm. the gap changes, um, resulted in a uh, actual dollar decrease uh, going out. Um, and is that decrease, right, if you, if you look at the curve and you get this decrease here, does it then continue at that level of decrease or does it jump back up to the original line at some point? I think it would be fair to say it continues at the level of decrease. Continues at the level yeah. of decrease, okay. And is that, um, there are, is that likely to decrease even more? Uh, not as a result of gap. So there are, uh, when we went through the gap proceeding, there are certain things that do impact year over year. One of those is advertising, advertising sales is included in the funding model that is put forward. And advertise, advertising sales vary from year to year. If it's an election year, there's, there are more advertising sales in particular markets that will lead to increased funding as a result of the percentage payment. So you will see some up and down as a result of those normal fluctuations in the business. No, I, I, it just seems to me that you can't really actually take out a year of, from your projections, right? Like, are you suggesting that we just um, disregard 2018 in your projections over time? No. Okay, I misunderstood that. Yeah, I think that, so what I was saying is that there was an adjustment as a result of the generally accepted accounting principles yes. that took place in that particular year. If you look at 2006, we were at statewide funding at about 3.5 million. 2007, we went to 4.2. Right. And then we consistently went up. And when we got to 2017, we're at 7.2 million. Right. In, in calendar year 2018, that number decreased to a little bit below 6.9 million. So there was right. that decrease. Yeah. Uh, we actually believe when we complete calendar year 2019, we'll be pretty steady with where we were in 2018. Right, okay. So that was one time reduction that endures. Yes. Right. And the yes. impacts on the access centers, as we heard, was significant because they're operating on such two strings. No, I understand that. Another question: um, The changes uh, that the FCC made said that, uh, as part of that five percent, you can count uh, in-kind contributions. 
And some of the things you listed, um, interactive program guide, uh, money for rebranding, um, 350 miles to build out, I'm not sure what that figures in. Uh, money for the equipment upgrades, is that included in what you are counting against you 5%? So the dollar amounts that I went over as a result of the settlement are not in-kind provisions of the CPG. Okay. All right, they are not. Not. So are there in-kind provisions that you are uh, providing as part of the 5% that actually decrease the amount of money going to the families? Uh, not, not, at the, not today. As, as we see it. So I think that a key word there is that um, stated earlier, uh, Representative, you said you, you can, but the, the, the provision, the ruling by the FCC is really not anything that we can choose to do or not do. Right. So if there are in-kind provisions, uh, they will be uh, assessed, uh, evaluated, and uh, determined whether or not uh, there will be a reduction from the 5%. To date, everything in the CPG, in the analysis, with the exception of courtesy services that remain in the CPG, and at, at this juncture, I believe the only things that are in kind are the courtesy services that are currently in the CPG. Okay, yeah, and, the, and the only reason I'm asking these mm -hmm. questions is because I really want to try and get a handle on the actual um, financial monetary uh, contributions AMOs as opposed to any, anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fair question. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now we are in an evaluation stage, and as I said, the only thing that we have determined at this juncture that are uh, in kind would be the courtesy services. So we're evaluating what those are, we're evaluating what the value is, and uh, then what the position will be with regard to whether or not there is an offset. Okay, thank you. Services to municipalities and schools or courtesy services to AMOs or both? Uh, both, but the AMOs one we took right. out, so right. those are gone. So potentially the courtesy services to municipalities and schools could be an offset. Yeah, and there has to be, we're evaluating that more in Glenn. We have to determine which ones are actually being utilized and determine what the, what the value is. And there may be an additional question on that as to whether or not there is a desire for those services to continue. So I think one of the challenges before us is um, to get a handle on what the short-term uh, revenue shortfalls are and more long-term concerns. And can we address each of those with one solution or is there a short-term solution to give us a little bit more time to then address what a longer-term uh, funding solution might be? And I think to that end, one of the things the Vice Chair and I have been talking about is just trying to get a handle on how much money is needed over the next year versus um, over the next five years per year. I see Lauren Glenn grabbing some papers. Is that related to this question? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Directly, yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry, we sent it Friday, but we may actually have it now. It was probably this. I'll just bring them Are these the, yeah, oh, this other one. Okay, mm -hmm. great. I'm sorry. I messed up the packets already. Yeah. Oh, you put the whole. Yep. She Look at you. You didn't receive it on Friday. That's okay. That's okay. So, so we'll yeah, no, no, so And so we can distribute to Thank folks you. in the audience for Glenn if you yeah. have light. I'll put them here. I didn't mean to cast these versions on Legislative Council. That was not <laughs> what I meant to do at all. Yes. <laughs> They've been incredibly helpful. And thank you for putting these today. No problem. Okay. Um, so, Lauren, do you want to, Lauren, do you want to take us through? Yeah, I do. I just want to get yourself situated. Okay, so these, these two pieces of paper. Yep. Um, so, Elizabeth Malone and the Van Working Group put this together in response to the question that you just raised, which is looking ahead, um, what, do, what does Van anticipate to be the funding gaps that we've we're concerned about. 
And so let me just address the, um, the text part and then the chart part. So the text here identifies what the assumptions are. And the assumptions are is that we expect cable revenue to, to continue on a steady, steady decline. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have, well, first thing I would say is we know that large companies like Comcast are working hard to keep their Xfinity customers and to keep customers coming through the, what is essentially a cable gateway. Um, so we understand that. And there's also, but we don't know what those trends are um, from the company's perspective. And really what we do know is the cord cutting trends that are reported publicly. So we assume that there will be a steady decline between now and 2030. Um, we, we, as you heard today, um, many of the access centers or several of the access centers are pursuing alternative revenue sources, including municipal funding, underwriting, and fees for services. And so what we have done on this chart is done some projections based on modest increases. And again, you heard from Tammy and, um, at NAT TV and Angelique in Richmond and these centers and for Trowbridge in Brownboro. And what these folks are saying is, we're working hard to diversify, but we don't think we're going to be able to make up the difference, the big difference. But you know, perhaps we can make up 30% of that over 10 years, right? So it's not impossible, it's just a pretty heavy lift. So what we did was create, um, roughly anywhere between a 2 and a 7% increase in each one of these categories between now and 2030. And this assumes that the access centers are doing what they do now, not that we would take up the IT as a revenue source, no special projects, you know, selling airtime on a statewide channel, those aren't factored here. This is just if we were to continue today. So we have a projection of the, um, the PEG fees declining. And then we see municipal contributions starting to increase. And again, this is an aggregate. So some centers may be more successful than others. We see that we could increase underwriting support over the next 10, 11 years. Fundraising, certainly, um, that will come, as we know, at a cost because the time spent is currently being used to deliver direct service, and then fees for service, diversification of charging for <coughs> memberships or production services. And then the loss offset funding. So this is, the, this is the part of the chart, I think, is the question you were asking is, you know, what do we think that we're going to have to make up? Make up, mm -hmm. and that's, so the expectation is not that a legislative solution would yield all of this revenue, mm -hmm. but it might yield a significant part of it as the cable revenue starts to decline. So again, the assumptions are not airtight, yep. but they're meant to create a scenario for us to understand what we are looking for. So what we're looking for really is a 40% franchise fee, potentially 40% offset, and 20% diversified revenue, which again will vary center to center. So it just gives us a picture mm -hmm. and start to visualize where we're at or where we think we will be. Was there anything you wanted to add, Kevin, to that explanation? That was great. Okay, thank you. Questions about the chart, clarifications needed? Comments? So is this an annual, so we have two, two, 2020, you have a $500,000 loss offset. So I, I imagine that stays the same in 2021, receiving another 500,000 in 22, and then it would jump up, uh, it would triple in 2023. So the half a mil is meant to represent that gap loss, mm -hmm. gap loss, which as centers are still struggling but, with. But it's an counts. annual, or is it for three years? Well, the gap loss, I mean, at a certain point, you stop talking about the gap loss. You just, your revenue has been adjusted in 2018, and it's here reflected, I think. We reflected I'm, it here in 2018. I was trying to understand. It might be a stupid question. You might have already answered it. Um, 
I just want to make sure that understand that that's a. It's an annual. It's annual, or is that uh, five hundred thousand dollars for three years? It's a snapshot of each year, so it's a snapshot of twenty twenty. So a snapshot uh, of twenty twenty. So just twenty 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 one and twenty twenty two are not present. Yeah. Okay. That's so this right. is going to fall somewhere in between the the, the two. Okay. Yep. Not a dumb question. We just took out those columns to make it look less complicated. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And essentially, it's the difference between <coughs> declining PEG fees and diversified funding efforts. Right. So, do you have any comments, Stan, on the accuracy or the um, reasonableness of those projections? Well, I, I, I might agree in 2020. Other than that, I, I, I just I, there's no way of knowing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a, and I mean no disrespect to your yes, assumptions. No, no, it's yeah. the best guess yeah. given the information we have right. now. Yeah. Carrie, did you have a question? Um, not just yet. Thank you. Okay. So now, now we get into the, the real meat of this committee, which is how to proceed given that what we what we know is that there's a half a million shortfall right now because of gap. Beyond that, we don't know exactly what it will look like, but we can assume it will be at least that and probably much more than that. Yeah. And so it is the time when we all sort of need to put our cards on the table and say, what, what are each of, each of us thinking about the best way forward? We have this meeting and then one more. By November 15th, we are supposed to make a recommendation to the legislature, whether it is in a well, we'll be in bill form of one way or another, whether it was a recommendation for funding or for further study. And so we don't have a, a tremendous amount of time between now and then. We need to give legislative council uh, time to do the drafting. And so it's, we have to really start kicking the ideas around now, kicking the tires and, and seeing uh, where we wanna go. So I'm happy to start wherever people would like to begin. I have no agenda other than to hear from the committee and see what emerges as as the themes. Um, there was some testimony this morning about um, other possible revenue sources. I'm um, looking in particular from Matt Kelly and the East of you, but um, that uh, might be worth considering. When I look at this chart um, and just look at the municipal piece. I, I think that's going to be a very heavy lift for for access stations, despite all the value that comes from them. But that money comes out of the property tax. It has to get voted at town meeting. And um, the property tax is the most stressed tax in the state right now. It's the one we always hear about. Mm -hmm. So I'm just very concerned that um, that, that may be rational request, I don't know that it's mm -hmm. one that you're actually going to get. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point, Karen. So even looking at the projection for what we might be able to expect from the municipalities, this might be a... Ambitious. Ambitious, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. So, Karen? Yes. Um, <clears throat> contributions from municipalities are generally a line item in the municipal budgets. Some, right. It depends on the town. Sometimes it's a line item in the municipal budget. Sometimes it's voted separately, like you have that long list of social service organizations, mm -hmm. $200, $500, and they're voted mm -hmm. separately in some towns as a package in some towns. If the, um, if the fees were considered an assessment on the towns based on the services they get from the AMOs, wouldn't that be something, I mean, the, the town, town budgets often do other assessments uh, that they basically have to provide because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise they give up yeah. the services. And so this could be considered the same way that, hey, if you're going to get benefit of this, you have to take the money to help support it. It could be considered that way. Yeah. Um, I think we, you know, given where I sit yeah. mm -hmm. as 
of the representative for local governments, um, we would support that. I mean, it, we would say it's a, it's a um, shift um, from, from, you know, well, not from the legislature, but it's a shift to the municipal level, which is frequently considered to be the fallback um, contributor of funding to whatever mm -hmm. is the cause of the day. And I, I don't mean to be the skunk at the garden party, but I think that's pretty realistic. Yeah. So if I, might, if I might just make a comment that one of the one of the questions in my mind is how far do we go to change the policy currently? The state does not have any involvement in supporting um, uh, public access television um, to provide a state uh, funding mechanism would be a change in policy. And um, so anyway, it's, it's something that it may or may not be acceptable to other legislatures, other, other, other legislators uh, at the state level. Uh, so whatever we recommend, we've got to recognize that if it involves a state funding source, it's going to be a policy change. And we're going to be taking on responsibilities as a state that we don't currently have. Right. Um, I, I did have one other thought. Um, this morning there was some discussion about um, interactive television. And if the access stations were to take on some of that um, responsibility, which I sort of think you're doing already, right, providing that um, mm -hmm. uh, access to, to information and, and um, events that that might be a legitimate role for the legislature to help fund. And it might be, it might come at quite a bit less than maintaining all those interactive television stations cost mm -hmm. when they were still there. So with that suggestion, I'd like to ask, uh, our uh, band representative here, uh, what, what technology, I mean, how, how uh, complicated would that be for the uh, public access TV stations to, to do, to provide Vermont interactive uh, services? We're looking at that right now. I don't have a completely cogent answer, but what we have been researching is the capital investment necessary mm -hmm. for a switched video network Mm -hmm. um, we certainly have the physical locations mm -hmm. um, and some capacity that could be farmed out on a fee-for-service basis, uh, but the real cost is going to be the capital investment. And as um, I think Stephen Whitaker may have pointed out, there are, it, it may not be as cumbersome and as expensive as it was the first time, and there are a couple ways to go, but it's not insignificant because having a bridge for 10 sites across the state is of high quality video. Two way switch is not insignificant. So we're researching those prices right now to understand what that would be in order to provide a, a sketch of a proposal for this committee to look at. Mm -hmm. okay. So we've, we've are putting together the capital expenses and then some of the operating expenses. Again, I think we can provide a sketch. But the real question is going to be how to recover that capital investment. Right? And to keep it upgraded. And there may, yeah. And I think the other issue is that a, the access centers that are Vermont Access Network are, we work very closely on policy questions, but we are a loosely assembled group, right? It's a very anarchistic group. I mean, just imagine municipalities trying to get together to do something. I mean, it's, you know, not, it's not our DNA. Our DNA is our policy work and then to serve our community. So that would be a shift in the way that this organizational capacity is directed. Mm -hmm. So it's not just simply lighting up the centers, it's changing how we work, which I don't think we're opposed to working through, but 
It's not in Spanish. Just in and some other thoughts? Yes, Sorry. please. I should have. Okay. Um, in the course of doing this work, um, we've done a lot of research about what is happening in other parts of the country related to this question of, and I'm going to use crude terms that may are not politically so palatable, but I'm just going to say them, which is how to extract public benefit from the right of way. So public access, the franchise fee, is a kind of compensation that is extracted or is put aside because the public right of way is being used by cable industry to provide commercial services. And so the FCC, or the Congress said in the Cable Communications Act, franchise fees are a kind of compensation for the use of that right of way. As we have talked about on the tele, so that's the communication side, that's Title VI. On the telecommunication side, Title II, universal service, 911, and other types of public benefit are a compensation, which is a better word than extraction, a compensation for the use of the rights of way. The dilemma that we're facing in both of those industries, the cable side and the telecommunication side, is that those technologies are being offset by the internet and by broadband. So people are getting their entertainment online. They're using VoIP for their phone. They're using other kinds of tools. So the revenue from the public benefits on both the cable side, the Title VI side, and the Title II side are declining. So regulators and policymakers looking at both of those industries are asking the same kind of questions. And they're looking to the internet as a revenue source, which is Title I, which has been reclassified as Title I, um, upheld in a recent FC, uh, DC court decision. But what we've been trying to find out is how tied are the state's hands with regard to collecting public benefit from broadband use, right? And there are different approaches to doing this. And in fact, a recent, this is also um, distributed to your desk, which came across our desk on, late last week, which I think has some bearing on this question. And then I won't go to my recommendation. So what is distributed to you here is a report um, by the members of the Federal State Joint Board on Universal Service. So again, keep in mind, universal service is a kind of public, public benefit on the telecom side, and public access is a public benefit on the cable Title VI side. And these state members of the federal state joint board have put in a series of recommendations that I think speak to this dilemma that we are looking at on the cable side. And on page six, um, in short, what they're saying is we should look to the internet and to broadband as a revenue source for universal service. Perhaps the kind of short story. And what they say here in number 12, paragraph number 12, um, commenters responding to the commission's FNRPM generally agree the commission could use its permissive authority, the FCC, the commission, I think that's right, yeah, to expand the contribution base for universal service. It is clear that the FCC has the legal authority to extend contribution requirements to a broader class of providers of interstate telecommunications where it is in the public interest. So when you have the opportunity to read this, when we leave, you're going to see that this state, the state members of the Federal State Joint Board are looking to broadband as a way to fund universal service. So in order for us to really understand what we can do as a state and what we can't, I think we need more study. And I think we need more in-depth study by people who spend their time thinking about these questions because when we started to delve in them, 
into these questions, we found some really interesting examples um, that actually, and in the case of this report, recommend connection-based assess assessments on residential services and revenue-based assessments on business services. So these are the kinds of ideas that are cooking on a national level, but also on state level. States like Virginia, states like Kentucky. There are different states that give us some examples. But it is beyond, I would say, my pay grade as a pretend litigator <laughs> um, to really have the legal understanding of what where the state's authority can live. And since this is a question that is, you know, certainly there's a $500,000 problem today, but as we can see, this is going to be, you know, this, we're not dropping off the cliff with mm -hmm. PEG revenue in the next couple of years. It's a slow decline. I think that with um, what I'm going to say, what I, the following things that I think could be in a kind of study, continued study, that we could commission with some help, possibly from the Attorney General's office, although whether they have adequate capacity to do this is an open question. Um, the study could include what is the state's authority to um, gain public benefit from the use of the rights of way? What are the limitations? What are models from other states? How could we calculate the revenue that's projected? And what kind of data and uh, mechanisms do we need in order to uh, potentially implement something along the lines of an omnibus public benefit from rights of way? That, um, so I'll put a period on that sentence. So I think we just need some more time and some more expertise because the direction that people are going in, policy recommenders are going in nationally is in the direction that I have just described, but it is really a new frontier, and our authority as a state is constantly in question mm -hmm. and isn't fully resolved and may never be fully resolved, but I think we could get our bearings if we study this very in a focused way. Therein and my comments. So let me ask a question. Uh, this is um, this is a proposal from the state members of the federal and state joint board on universal service. Yeah. To the federal. Federal ones, right? Who have frankly iced them out, and so they've decided yeah. they're going to just put in their recommendations, whether they're being asked for them or not. Okay. So so basically, there was no response from the federal. It just was issued on October 15th. The response was issued? No, 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 this. Oh, this was? This was. Yeah, okay. this is hot off the press. Filed. Filed. Filed, yes. Oh, this was filed October 15th. That's the okay. correct one, yeah. yeah. All right. So we have no feedback from the federal regulators? No, um, but it represents quite a bit of research that right. I think is germane for our discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though it deals with universal service, it is the same it is a relevant policy question to what we're asking. Okay. So, um, I, would, I would say I could sound like a broken record, but some of the younger people who were in the room wouldn't know what that was, so I, I can't say <laughs> anymore. But I, I think those are fair statements. Um, not the recommended decision, but the what, what you said with regard to a couple of things. Uh, with regard to the services currently offered, there's a five, as we know, we've gone over earlier, there's a 5% cap, we're at the 5% cap. I think that if you go back to, uh, from 06 uh, 06 through 19, you've seen a pretty big, substantial increase, you've seen a leveling off on that. So as a result of that, I also think it's fair to look at 2020. My rough math is we probably finished ahead of the prior year. Uh, at the end of 19 as compared to 18, but we'll see where that comes out, just rough math on that. Um, I do think also that, I think you said two things that I, I think are worth considering in the fact that we're not at a cliff today. Uh, and I think Lauren Glenn is 
it is correct, let's perhaps look at what the options are, but I think the reverse of that is fair to look at what the limitations of that are too. And I don't think that's something that, look, it's above my pay grade too, as much as I'd like to compliment myself. Uh, so that I do think that there has to be a, a, perhaps a broader analysis. And as a result of not being at a cliff today, I think it's a, it would be, in my opinion, a fair recommendation of this group to explore the options and limitations so that we could perhaps regroup at a, at a later date uh, in 12 to 24 months to relook at that issue. Uh, and I don't know how you write that or how you, how you put that into effect, but I think it would be, otherwise we might be, uh, meaning no disrespect to anyone on the panel here, we might be spinning our wheels a bit to find out what we want to come up with. So I think it's fair not being at a cliff uh, to look at options and limitations. Uh, and perhaps we might find that there are options, but we also may find that the limitations uh, prohibit those options, and I just don't know what they are. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a fair discussion. I do wonder um, if we were to go that route, what does that do to budgets for the next year or so for the access? stations, the magnitude of stations. It goes back to my question, is there a short-term fix needed? Mm -hmm. That is, um, you know, is it a, is it a straight appropriation act? What, you know, what is that? Mm -hmm. um, that will bide us some more time. And so I think that is also a question before us. If, but I want, I want Clay to be able to weigh in, because I'd like to either a question or a clarification, but I think you know, basically what Lauren Glenn has put on the table is, is this um, a viable next step for us, is to ask for more um, research in these areas. And of course, that also will probably require an appropriation to pay for that, that study, and who might do that study. So, uh, but we'll put that on hold for a second. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm relieved to hear that it's above your pay grade and your pay grade. It's safe to say it's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, Is that the not in? Is that the... Uh... But um, I did just want to point out uh, to, to the comment that, you know, what is the, or the question, or what is the, the you know, fair uh, charge or um, to extract um, a benefit from the use of the public rights of way that, when you talk about USF or you talk about the 5% franchise fee, the companies aren't paying that. That's a pass through tax to the users um, and to people like all of us who are customers of mm -hmm. telephone and cable companies. So there's an impact on Vermonters and the going to the affordability of living in Vermont. A lot of states have, for their own USF, have moved to a connection-based fee for, tele for an assessment on telephone service. And, and that's fine, you have to realize that that, moving from a percentage of your retail bill to a flat connection fee has an impact that may be disproportionate on Vermonters. So um, a consumer that spends a lot of money on these services may see a slight reduction Whereas a consumer who spends only a small amount mm -hmm. may see an incredible increase in their monthly fee. And so I think that's just something to think about. Um, but I do concur that I think studying it is, is uh, a very good idea and really understanding the limits of our jurisdiction, um, especially with letting a fee on internet sales, because I think that that's an area where both the FCC and Congress have spoken out quite clearly against. Yeah, I think that's fair. And by studying, I'm not advocating a particular mm -hmm. position, but I think it's I think it's worth. And I think Clay raises a very valid point that uh, uh, federal authorities have opined uh, on this on this matter. And so. So a lot of different directions we could go in, but I want to make sure we come back to something the vice chair said earlier, which is, are we, as a committee, in agreement that um, that we should be weighing in on 
an area in which we haven't had authority in the in the past. I'm I'm restating your right. other question. Um, and um, an additional thought on that is that I mean, there's a number of different ways that we go. Um, we could try to introduce uh, an increase in the U.S. set fee, which would provide a certain amount of money. Um, we could propose another type of fee, which may or may not be uh, acceptable based on current, current uh, criteria by the FCC. Um, or we could just go to straight appropriation process and say, for the short term, we could uh, ask the uh, appropriations committee to allocate a certain amount to uh, provide grant, a grant program for, uh, for the AMOs that need that type of uh, uh, assistance. Um, the latter case is probably the most simple doesn't change, it doesn't do much in terms of a change in policy uh, on the part of the state, and it's been done before on a one-time basis. Um, in the meantime, we could ask for a study for um, what the possible ramifications are and abilities of the state to, to make a, some other type of a, uh, engage in some other type of uh, method for funding. So am I hearing a general consensus that one of the main charges coming out of here that we'll give to the legislature is a, a study of some kind? Is that what I'm, you want to uh, assume that is what people are thinking? Dan, <laughs> what are you thinking, Dan? <laughs> I would, I, I believe, and I may be in the minority, I believe that the current level of funding at this juncture, given, given the increase that it has seen over the last decade, with a relatively stable, uh, other, uh, other factors of the economy being very stable, I would submit that we should not, at this juncture, have a request for legislative action for additional funding. I do think that we should continue the model, and we're not at a cliff, we should see what happens over a determined period of time and then re-examine. Um, that's just one person's opinion. Mm -hmm. we take a short break? We, we may. How much time would you like? Five minutes. Absolutely. We'll take a five minute break. Are we back on the record? So, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to take a, Absolutely. Take a quick break. Yeah. Um, so I just want to be clear on a, a couple of points. So uh, obviously I, I work for Comcast, yes. but I'm the industry representative here today. And I think as the industry, we have no opinion with regard to the, uh, if there were a legislative effort on the $500,000, we'll stand back from that. We have no opinion on it. That said, we do think, as I stated, that the 5% the has uh, increased at a level that, that continues uh, for the provision of meaningful public access by uh, the Vermont Access Network and its members. Uh, while others on the panel want to look to opportunities that may exist, we, the, our counter to that from the industry would be to ensure that we as a group also look to the limitations mm -hmm. uh, that would exist. And uh, obviously, as, as any, uh, both the representative and the senator know, it's, it would all be in the language as well that Absolutely. we would want to look at. So just wanted the opportunity to make those comments. Thank you. You're welcome. And so, and when you speak of the limitations, you're speaking specifically about federal preemption? Is that Correct. what we're discussing? Yeah. Okay, Correct. just Thank to make you. it clear. So, back to the question at hand, Lauren Glenn has proposed um, that recommendation perhaps coming out of this committee is for, for further study. And so, the, the pieces I'd like to get nailed down today, what would that study entail? What are all the 
uh, the different areas of research, who might be charged with, with doing that research. We don't know yet uh, how much would be needed to be appropriated to do that research. And as Maria uh, Royal, our ledge counsel lawyer, reminded us, that would be in addition if we felt like, as a committee, we needed an appropriation to backfill the, um, the money left uh, unaccounted for from, from the gap changes. So what are, what are the charges that we would like to give to a group um, hired to do the research for us? What are those various threads? So one is about rights of way. Yeah, so I would just, I'll just recap just for the purpose of moving it forward. Uh, I think the question of the state's authority to assess public benefits mm -hmm. from the various titles, you know, one, two, and six, mm -hmm. and even 32, is 32, is that the one, the, the, um, the agency of transportation right-of-way fee that we heard the right-of-way chief talk about? So there's certain limitations. So if you could, Laura Glenn, just go over those just a little bit more slowly so I make sure that our yeah. attorney can get down all the yes. different pieces. So, I mean, this is not the perfect thing. But yes, no, this, this but, is work, a yeah. work in progress. But state authority um, to assess public benefits for the use of its right-of-way from, from, from firms that from private companies that utilize the right of way. And that those, that authority, both the authority and the limitations, as Dan said, we would look at Title I, which is, you know, internet, Title II, which is telecom, from which universal service is extracted, Title VI, which is cable. I think I want to say Title 32, which is the right of way, the agency of the U.S. transportation statutes that govern the state's management of its of federal and state right-of-way. I will double check if that's the right number. And then, um, so not only authority and limitations, but models what other states are doing that may indicate a way forward and what other entities are recommending, like these state members of the federal state mm -hmm. board, for example, and what other um, decisions, such as, example, um, the recent DC Court of Appeals ruling on the Mozilla FCC case, which has to do with net neutrality, but may have implications on state authority to manage and acquire broadband compensation of some kind. What was the last thing? So the net neutrality case, the DC Court of Appeals recently um, came forward and they said a couple of things. They said that the FCC's decision to classify internet as Title I stood, <coughs> so it should stand, it, it was an appeal. But they also talked about revisiting state authority because the FCC said states have no authority to do anything related to net neutrality. And the DC Court of Appeals said we, that needs to be looked at again because we're not convinced that's true. They didn't say go ahead states. Mm -hmm. They said we, this needs to be looked at some more. So there are, a lot, there are several cases that are in play that have an impact mm -hmm. on the direction of policy nationally and on state level. Um, yeah. Um, just to add to your t list of titles around right of way, you might want to add Title 24. Um, municipal highways are actually the vast majority of roadways in the state. Title 24? Yeah. That's the municipal statutes. Yeah. And what this municipalities can and can't do related to this is a really interesting question of it. Merits, merits some investigation. And then um, finally, to, um, you know, with this research and what we can and can't do or could be done to create some models for calculating what the revenue projections would be. Um, and if we actually have 
what we need to calculate that. Because, for example, um, as my friend Stephen Whitaker points out often, you know, we don't have GIS data on where all the poles are in the state. And so if one of the models was a pole attachment fee, I know that's not your favorite thing, Clay, but I'm just saying, <laughs> if it was, um, we might not even have what we need to say, well, how much would that generate? Because we might not know where they are and what's multiply them by. <clears throat> I think, Karen, did you have something else? Karen? No, that was it right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I do think it's uh, worth noting that uh, a couple of things that uh, were spoken about, that the, the franchising law that exists with regard to cable service, which is where the 5% comes from, uh, finds in its writings that the, the cap is at 5% for the use of the public right of way for the provision of services. And I think one thing that's worth stating uh, as well is that that outline in federal law is specifically outlined that the local franchising authority shall determine what that is. And there are, or there are local franchising authorities that are at the 5%, but it also follows through that some of them are as low as 1% or even less than that across the country. But what is determined as a, uh, it, it, as a local franchising authority is interested. Because here in the state of Vermont, the local franchising authority is at the state level, meaning the certificate of public good is given by the state. So they have taken the authority through their state law as given to them under federal law to determine that they are the local franchising authority. As we go south to Massachusetts, the Massachusetts legislature has, through that authority under federal law, determined that the local franchising authority is, in fact, the municipality. So it's important to recognize that, that the 5% the, the is at the 5% in Vermont because the local franchising authority being the state has put it at that. And in Massachusetts, it varies based upon the, as a son of Massachusetts, I'm embarrassed that I don't know the number of communities, but the number of communities throughout the state that choose to do that between as low as less than 1% and as high as the 5%. Um, and then in uh, other jurisdictions, in Connecticut, which is very similar to how it's operated here in Vermont, the local franchising authority is the public utility regulatory authority as empowered by the statutes in the state of Connecticut. And similarly, over in New York, they follow a model that's very similar to Massachusetts. So it varies, but the LFA, or the Local Franchising Authority, is just that, and they determine the 5%. So that's my long-winded way of saying there really isn't an opportunity under the federal law for it to be granted at the franchise fee at the state and then have an additional grant, uh, grant of that by a local municipality. Just wanted to put that out there. In addition to the 5%. In addition, correct. Thank you. Well, I think I think that's an, a valuable clarification. I think it's also important to know that on the FCC level, you know, the trend is it, it, the most recent FCC case looking at whether in-kind services should be subtracted from the five percent. That's not a finished case. In other words, there's more cases to follow, and least access. Television is being looked at as to whether that is a violation of the cable operator's First Amendment rights. That's an argument that's being made. It may be that public access in the next five to seven years, not to be an alarmist, but the way that the, the direction of the work of the FCC is going is towards eliminating PEG as a requirement and to create a level playing field that does not require PEG franchise fees. So we're also dealing with a, a a bigger ecosystem in which franchise fees may go away in the term of this conversation that we're having. And so to understand where we might be able to recover them when there is no 5% to recover is an important bigger picture. So I, I don't mean to be dire, but the sort of policy horizon that we're looking at is one in which um, the FCC may say, no, peg franchise fees, that's that deal that was made in 84 with the municipalities, in exchange for rights of way, that's not legitimate anymore. So, um, of course, that would go to Congress. I mean, you know, it's an endless cycle, but that's the environment we're operating in. 
I've not read those tea leaves like you have read them. <laughs> I'm a paranoid litigator. <laughs> the crystal ball is spot. That's right. Other thoughts? So, a actually, yes. Just with, with respect to that point of view, um, that might change considerably what kind of information we would want from any um, further study here. <coughs> if you think that those fees are going to go away altogether, then what are we looking at? Yeah, but respectfully, I don't think we can live. I, I don't think that we, that we were, uh, our charter was to look at what is. I think it was to look at what is currently. And we're looking at what is rather than these. It, 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 and I get where you're coming from. But uh, we believe that the provision of PEG access is going to continue. Uh, and we see nothing, nothing away from that. And I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I think the reason I brought it up in response is that if there is no five, I mean, there is a 5% limitation, but if there is no 5%, then looking at alternative, then there's, then that's not a limitation, right? And, you know, what the state's authority, changing authority in terms of broadband fees, which I understand are pretty curtailed, but there are some interesting examples that could be looked at, then it, it, it's a different discussion, and we're looking at a longer term horizon. So. You know, it's hard to deal with speculation, but well, and we're I trying think to deal with what's really happening. The important thing, I think, for all of us to keep in mind is um, we still have democracy, and we will continue to have a legislature that functions, and we will continue to have committees of jurisdiction that will continue to look at these issues. And so, I really see the charge of the committee. We are we are moving us towards currently getting more information that we need. Assuming, you know, best case scenario, we're looking at a minor short, shortfall in the future that we need to, to fill, and long term, that at least we have the information that we need to figure out what choices that we can make in the future for a longer term uh, funding mechanism if it's needed. I think all of us who serve, I can speak for you, Mike, as well, um, who serve understand that the only constant is change. So we can only deal with what's in front of us. And it could be that when we sit down in January, um, there has already been uh, another piece thrown into this conversation. And so all we can do is, in good faith, move the conversation forward. Um, and I don't think either of us, as long as we are in the legislature, are going to take our eye off of this issue, because it's one that's of significance to both of us. So, um, And I appreciate that you in this conversation are not always glass half full because we need to be sober about the conditions that we're in. So I appreciate both of these perspectives very much and I appreciate that you're both willing to serve on this committee because we need both of those views. So. I have one more thing. To absolutely. Um, so the last piece for Maria, um, not, so following the creating the models for calculation and making sure that we have some ways, we have what we need to make those projections. I would say we could also, an outcome of this study committee would be some draft policy that the legislature could consider going forward. But that's some language mm -hmm. that would come out of that discussion. And so in terms, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, when you talk about draft policies, um, what do you have in mind there? I don't have anything in mind yet, but I just wanted to make sure that a deliverable was some lang what was language that we could move. Because coming out of the study, what you want recommendations maybe from what other states are doing, or what is permissible, what is not permissible, so it's summarized as an output of this study. Specific directives of who's doing the study. Is that what you're saying? Well, more like We've looked at all this, we've done crunch these numbers, and we think here's the two or one or two ways forward for the legislature to consider as policy. Because this is about policy change, ultimately. It, it I mean, can be about policy or change. Or it yes. could just be an allocation. Or it could just be right. allocation. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's a policy change, what would be <laughs> recommended? Yeah. I think any policy change would have to be informed by the results of the study that we're proposing. Precisely. I, 
Well, I guess one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more meeting left. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a chance to see a draft right. and add another like, round of discussion sure. on that draft. Absolutely. Okay. So um, the chair and I met with our leg just legislative council, Maria Royal, who's been staffing this committee. And um, the, what we're trying to do here today is to give her the rough outline of um, some drafting that she can do for us. We'll circulate it to the committee, and certainly, you know, it, when it gets to be something that is uh, coherent enough to, to post to the website, we'll do that, and then we will come back um, at the next meeting and really deal with the document in front of us, and then by the 15th we're supposed to have, of November, we're supposed to have that nailed down. So it's a pretty tight timeline. Yeah. So okay. just one other um, probably extremely unpopular suggestion. But, um, when you're looking at um, ways to raise revenue for um, and, you know, continuing an enterprise, it might be worth also looking at is this the most effective delivery system for those kinds of services? And you might want to put that. Did you get that right? More effective, more effective in terms of well, I um, I just don't know, but we we have um, around the state uh, how many? Twenty-five. Yeah, and you're and you're organized. You're not actually organized under a ban, but you know, as you described it, you're anarchistic. Mm -hmm. I love anarchy actually. Did um, <laughs> we get that out of record? <laughs> Karen Horn approves of the anarchy. But um, there might be. There might be more efficient ways to um, provide the coverage and the services that you're providing in all those different PEG access stations. And it's worth thinking about, at least. I would second that. I would like to learn a little bit more about how AMOs can share resources and be less anarchic and um, more collaborative. And whether a statewide AMO could serve a function that could replace or supplant some of the functions that the 25 other AMOs are all doing, to, you know, separately, could they be done together? Or even as simple as you know, sharing equipment. Maybe you do that already, but um, No, you're, you're welcome to jump in. I, I really want it to be a conversation. I, I think that's. I think it's a fair question. I think that um, the, any effort to consolidate local services, and I, I realize it's not the same as who I'm saying it to. <laughs> Just a legislative, you know, legislative room. And we've looked at school, you know, school consolidation. So I'm sorry to go here, but um, the, the cost of consolidating is often as much as what you would say. And so, um, because it's so uniquely local, these access centers are serving these local areas. It makes it very difficult to consolidate resources, <coughs> perhaps regionally, but statewide, really hard. So I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it, and I'm not saying we're not looking at it, but I'm just, I'm not convinced that the money that you save, you actually save, because you have <coughs> create an infrastructure, a management infrastructure that you didn't have before. So I completely agree with you on that, and it might not, and consolidation might not be the answer at all, but, you know, have we thought, and I know that all the stations work on a shoestring, that was quite evident this morning, but um, are there different ways to do things if we thought about it creatively? Um, I'm, I'm completely on the same page with you with respect to school consolidation, so, um, you know, being, combining administration doesn't always say a dime, but um, it's just, I think, if you're going to look at raising the revenues to fund this enterprise or these enterprises, you sort of have an obligation to look at the other side of it. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you were. Oh, I'm just, I was looking at my calendar. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, so, 
other information that Maria Royal needs to write up a draft of a charge for um, research that we have it. I just want to confirm that would be a draft that we can. Yes. Oh yes. Busy. Okay, perfect. This Great. oh things move slowly in the legislature. Got it. <laughs> this will be a draft. So I'd like the opportunity to share it with industry partners and to look at it with respective legal departments so that they can they can opine on it as well. Yes, yeah. and we as a committee also need to decide, and we don't have to do that today. I think we're all pretty um, spent from sitting for so long. So, but we have to decide. It's not clear in the legislation whether we all need to agree on what comes out of the work group or not. So to be discussed, we do not do, need to do that right now. But yes, it will be a draft, and there will be plenty of time to weigh in um, on that. Great, thank you. And again, the, with the understanding that whatever we come out with from this committee is subject to further change by the Got it. Yes. Yes. jurisdiction. Yes. Yeah. And do we have to have a recommendation, did you say, by the 15th of November? That is what the, yeah. the act says, yes. So we have to meet before that. Exactly. So, do you have a schedule for meeting? We don't, we don't have a date yet scheduled, but I'm not ready to move on to dates. I see you all pulling out no, your phones. I'm not ready to do that yet. Um, because the other piece of this is, do we want language in the draft that talks about the short-term funding gap? And if we do, what does that look like? You had talked uh, to me as, as an aside, should it be a grant program that we put in place for those specific uh, channels that do have a, a gap? Some, some do not. So what, what should it look like? What do we want to, um, if anything, what language do we want in there in dealing with the short-term gap that we have? And one of the suggestions was that uh, in terms of what we were just talking about, uh, that perhaps it, it, if we if we had an estimate about how much money would be available in the next fiscal year, um, it shouldn't be the state administering it and deciding, you know, who gets, uh, what? Who gets what and how much and how that. But we might have um, we might have to develop a formula for legislation, but uh, one way to do it would be to. Um, Appropriate it so that it could be administered by the Vermont Action Access Network. I think it would be worth drafting some language for us to respond to along those lines. Okay. Yeah. Other thoughts on that? Well, it certainly would make uh, a little difficult for me to agree to the or sign on to the whole report. Just a draft. Just, just draft. a draft. Just yes. a draft. So, but you should tell us what your, your concerns are. Certainly, um, this report does not preclude legislators from recommending appropriations separately. Mm -hmm. So it might be yep. uh, something to think about. Um, I guess I'm not opposed to a draft. Wonderful. Yeah, you know <laughs> He's not opposed to a draft. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it might be worth for us to give some thought. We could do it sooner rather than later, whether there should be a VIT component in there. That's come up. I don't know if it's sort of kitchen sinkish, but mm -hmm. it might just be worth it for us to. So let's put a placeholder in there for VIT. Yeah. We can always, again. Decide, but I would just put that on the table for the revival of the IT or an allocation to study it to get it ready, you know, to do a uh, proof of concept or I don't, you know, yep. maybe phase. I don't know the best way to do it, but it might be a, an interesting partnership between the state and Vermont Access Network members that lays the groundwork for other opportunities. So it's we could formulate that a little bit more clearly in the next few days. All right. So I think we have to now do the very messy job of trying to find a date in common. Um, we want to do it the week of the 4th, which is the week before the 15th. I am out of town the 7th. 
Learning the sixth. Fourth or fifth? I could do the fifth. Okay. Fourth is tough for me. Okay. You cannot do the fifth? Fifth, fifth is not, not, not available to me. Did, did people say the sixth was not an option for people? I'm good with the sixth. I am not good with the sixth. Okay. <laughs> um, though, did you say you couldn't do the sixth? Uh, no, I can't. I might be able to do the sixth if it's if it's a morning meeting at like nine. I'm sorry, Dan. Morning. I can be here then. Okay. Yeah. I ha how long is it going to take me to get to Middlebury from here? I don't know. That's an hour. An hour. An hour. <laughs> It'll take me two hours Ish. from here. All right. Um, I have to be in Middlebury at noon. Um, I could I could start at eight thirty. And, <laughs> and I'm coming from Western Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. So um, so that's a possibility. Sorry. Was, was November fourth out for folks? Fourth works for me. I have a meeting, unfortunately, that only happens every two weeks that I have to be at. Okay. Right. Friday. Eighth, I cannot do. We have a. We have a. Then the seventh is no good, right? Okay. Well, could we do the? Okay. Is the eleventh out of the question? Uh, it's uh, Veterans Day, so that might oh. um, throw some folks yes. off. Yes. Doesn't give a lot of time so. to write the report. Okay. Um, so, if people are willing to go with. Earliest on the sixth. I think that's the only date that's <laughs> a remote possibility. Let's do that. Let's meet at eight forty-five, eight thirty. How about eight thirty to ten? Hour and a half. Eight thirty to ten. And we ought to be able to do it then. We'll circulate the draft before then. Yeah. Great. Eight thirty to ten on what day? The sixth. Six. And also keep in mind the meeting will not be here at the state house because we're we'll closed. Oh, right. So we we'll got about find that alternative <coughs> place for you. Might be the tax building, no, might be National Life. Mike will pick it out and get back to you guys. Okay. Let's certainly check to see if the board room is open. Yeah. Okay. Let me just no. one yeah. real quick. Okay. So Location we'll TBD. Any other comments before we wrap? Maria, do you feel like you have what you need? Mostly. I think so. I think so. You'll we'll see it all circulated around. Yeah. The only other thing is I didn't know if you, since you're only you're meeting one more time. Right. And the draft legislation is due November 15th. Of course, the introduction deadline is not until December, so nothing will be. Right. In terms of making the request. Right. So I didn't know if you want more time and maybe meet the week of the 11th, understanding that there even more time to share with your departments or people to get as much input before you actually convene for one last time. And I'm assuming, if I'm correct, I'm assuming that at that meeting you're going to finalize. So it's not going to be you're going to recirculate. You're going to actually try to finalize at your last meeting. Is that right? Or do you want to, maybe I'm wrong about that, maybe you want to leave time to circulate for the 15th? And, uh, I, I know, I'm in DC almost the entire next, next week. week. Okay, never mind. Which doesn't mean. Yep. Um, so maybe it's helpful to, to have that cushion and of extra time if you want to. I think we're good. I think okay. the date is good. Okay, and that'll. Okay, yeah, okay. great. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, no problem. Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, thanks. Yep.